So uh, this uh, seminar today and all the questions, et cetera, are being recorded. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Amin Desfouli of the Goddard uh, Global Modeling and Assimilation Office to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Amin. Hi. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Saman Razavi. Uh, Dr. Razavi is an associate professor of hydrology and water resources engineering at the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, he received his PhD in civil engineering from University of Waterloo in 2013. Uh, Saman's research has focused broadly on data analysis and modeling of hydrological processes using various techniques, including machine learning, which is the topic of today's talk. And uh, Salman is perhaps the first person that I heard the term artificial neural networks from, and that was nearly 20 years ago when we did our masters in the same lab. And since then, he's been actively using machine learning in his research. And uh, just recently, I was thinking to incorporate deep learning in my own research, so I reached out to him for advice and that led to several interesting discussions where he explained when we should and should not use deep learning. So I thought that perspective would be of interest to many of us here at the Earth Division and particularly at the Hydrological Sciences Lab. And uh, today he's here to tell us more about his views on deep learning applications in Earth and environmental sciences. So Saman, please take it away. Thank you, Mike and Amin, for the invite and the kind introduction. And it's always nice to remember the old days. Uh, hello, everyone. Before I begin, I first like to thank Amin Desfouli and Sujai Kumar in your office, who I have had the privilege to interact with and discuss over the past months some aspects of uh, what I'm going to present today. So let me begin with explaining what motivated me about a year ago to look into the kind of things that I'm going to talk about today. Deep learning is, which is an artificial intelligence technique, has already served a vast majority of us, if not all, at least through our smartphones in tasks such as image recognition, natural language processing, and many others. And more recently, deep learning is showing revolutionary performance in other areas, like in generative modeling, in applications such as writing essays, and I invite you to have a look at that Guardian article, for example. And of course, it enjoys significant media coverage and sometimes hype. So this recent unprecedented performance in those applications has shifted our attention and relevant funding agencies to apply deep learning in non-native areas, such as earth and environmental sciences, where knowledge-based or process-based modeling has dominated to date. For example, about 5% of presentations in the last American Geophysical Union fall meeting were on machine learning, mostly deep learning, while this figure was around only 0.2% just a few years before, in 2015. Different AGU sections have shown varying degrees of shift, of course. Nonlinear geophysics was the front runner and at 28% in this past AGU. And the hydrology section, which is my home section, has seen a dramatic shift as well in the past five years from 1.4% in 2015 to more than 7% just in the past, in this past AGU. A major challenge, however, is that deep learning and process-based modeling are rooted in different worldviews towards problem solving, which is sometimes ignored. Any inadequate recognition and appreciation of those differences can limit bridgeability and also cross-fertilization of the two modeling paradigms. The thing is, the two, mod, uh, the two paradigms have largely evolved in uh, different camps with different modeling cultures in somewhat isolation from one another. For example, the value of knowledge base is often ignored in deep learning, whereas process-based modelers often forget what they do is essentially involving some sort of statistical or let's say informal machine learning component to it. So with that 
motivation, here is my objective to, to give this talk. I'm going to provide a quick and high level overview of the evolution history of deep learning that is essentially about artificial neural networks and its main ups and downs or waves since inception to where it is today. Um, and uh, I'm going to provide some insight into the fundamental but sometimes ignored differences of deep learning and process-based modeling with the help of a simple hydrologic modeling example. And uh, more broadly, I think recognizing the differences and the value of each paradigm will contribute to the recognition sorry, the reconciliation of the two modeling cultures. I understand that there is some long-standing issues around mistrust in the data-driven modeling in part of our community, particularly among core or hardcore process hydrologists and theory-driven uh, modelers. I have extensively dealt with that issue over the years. As Amin said, I actually started my research career back in 20, 2003 with machine learning and neural networks in particular. But in more recent years, I have had the opportunity to delve into process-based modeling as well. And therefore, I have had the privilege to have extensive and constructive conversations with researchers who uh, do not trust machine learning. So uh, I hope what I do can serve in bringing the two worldviews together and promote the dialogue between the champions of machine learning and those of process-based modeling. On that note, uh, let me tell you this as well. What I don't wish to do is to ignore or minimize the benefits of the recent developments in deep learning for environmental modeling, which are essentially the applications of deeper neural networks that have been made possible by the growth in computational power and data availability. And I don't wish either to exaggerate such benefits or to compare deeper versus shallower neural networks. And I understand that shallower neural networks have also uh, subject, uh, been subject to extensive and successful research in the past three decades or so in the field of environmental modeling. Uh, for more on those, you could refer to a paper of mine that is under review and has been posted on AGO ESOR. And I should say, I have had the privilege to receive relatively extensive feedback from the community so far on it, and some of them were very mixed, which I attribute to the extensive excitement that currently exists around AI and machine learning in earth and environmental sciences community. And uh, I put those disclaimers there because uh, there, they, there are about, uh, there were about two extreme but contrasting views that I have received on that paper to date. So I also just wanted to reiterate that neither of those is the intention here. So what is deep learning? Deep learning models are nothing but artificial neural networks that have been around for decades. Uh, it's, made, it's made of small processing units called perceptron that I'm showing here or neurons because of its resemblance to the basic working unit of the brain. So a, a neuron yeah, a neuron receives uh, multiple inputs, x values, and multiply each by a set of weights, and then the weighted sum of those go through an activation function, which is typically nonlinear to produce the neuron response y. So what you look at, at the formula, when you look at that the formulation of a neuron, it's basically nothing but a multiple linear regre regression augmented by a nonlinear function. It has d plus one tunable parameters. D is of course the dimensionality of the input. And now that but now uh, that we know the building block of neural networks, uh, basic neurons, let's quickly review its historical evolution since inception all the way to now. The invention of perceptrons back in 1950s created significant excitement in the AI community and beyond. 
but it soon became clear that a perceptron would not be able to map input spaces that are not linearly separable, such as the XOR problem, rendering perceptrons of limited use in real-world applications. The reason for this inability is that the core of the perceptron is a linear regression. So different ideas were tried back then to address this issue, but the most viable one was to combine perceptrons, those single neurons, both in parallel and in series to create a, a so-called multi-layer perceptron. Uh, with the, hope, with the hope this more complex system could overcome the barrier. This network would then have many more tunable parameters than a perceptron. The total number of layers in a neural network and the number of neurons in each layer then are, so these, these are each layer and each layer has its own number of neurons, right? So these are hyperparameters to be specified by the user. So, this progress uh, was good progress, but uh, these networks on their own did not go far and the field, field stagnated, stagnated at that point for many years because of the absence of an algorithm that could automatically derive from data the network's weights and biases. So it took until the mid 1980s when the first back propagation algorithm or BP algorithm was invented to enable the training of neural nets with any structure. This invention marked the beginning of the second wave of popularity of neural networks. Soon after, neural networks were proven to be universal approximators and this proof indicated networks with only one single hidden layer basically only one of these hidden layers, and this is the input and this one the, is the output layer, could uh, approximate any function with any desired level of accuracy, provided the number of hidden neurons is, is sufficient. So that universal function approximator uh, initiated a lot of momentum again in the community. And at that point, different approaches were being developed to introduce memory and time dependency, and also special dependency to the neural networks. Different ideas appeared to do so, such as tabular lines, time delay neural networks, recurrent connections, recurrent neural networks, and the idea of information gates and long short-term memory or LSTM networks. And of course, co-evolutional, uh, sorry, convolutional uh, neural networks to account for special dependency and structure in data appeared also back then. This is also the point where neural networks started receiving much attention in earth and environmental sciences. The first publication around neural networks in our fields uh, started appearing in the early 1990s. But despite all of these advances to this point in time, investments in neural networks and therefore their popularity saw a decline in the AI community beginning in the mid 1990s, uh, reportedly triggered by failures to fulfill overly ambitious or unrealistic promises by prominent AI scientists as historically observed in AI winters. And AI winters, uh, I think, is something very important to know about. They have been uh, pretty common in the history of AI technologies, an AI winter is a period of reduced funding and interest in artificial intelligence research. And the amplitude of these waves and periods have been pronounced, really, compared with any other field of research. Of course, we are also used to waves in our own research, but in AI, that, that, that the amplitude of, of that wave is quite pronounced. The reason for that, uh, perhaps, is that AI relates to science fiction, which can capture our imagination and we as people get quickly excited about. But the field reportedly has also been filled by overexcitement, over promises and over sellings. And whenever there was a failure in delivering those promises, a major decline in funding and investment followed. There is quite a bit of literature on AI, AI, AI winters and uh, their what's and why's and a good source to begin with if you have interest in AI winters is Wikipedia. 
I should add that during this decline period, neural networks in earth and environmental sciences remained fairly po popular, arguably until the mid uh, uh, 2000s. The focus of researchers in these fields was to find uh, novel applications of uh, neural networks across different earth and environmental problems. Anyways, it took until early 2010s before the third wave of popularity and interest in neural networks hit, when the field was revived and renamed or rebranded as deep learning. Depth uh, is a recently popularized term and loosely refers to the number of hidden neurons, hidden, sorry, hidden layers in a neural network. A related term is width, which loosely refers to the number of neurons in hidden layers. Now, a deep learning model or a deep neural network typically refers to a network with two or more or many more hidden layers. So before we review a couple of major milestones, consider the fact that the structure, formulation, and other properties of neural net networks have remained largely unchanged since their inception, um, except for some, uh, some modifications. So for those who used to use neural networks before, say around, say until around 10 years ago, but haven't followed recent literature, it might be surprising a bit to see their tremendous re revival. They might ask, um, what did drive the recent rise uh, of neural networks? What was the problem that is not resolved? And, and is deep learning merely a rebranding of these techniques that existed before? So to address these questions, we would first need to discuss what historically drove interest towards networks with only a single hidden layer, a shadow network, that are uh, sometimes now called shadow uh, neural networks. While of course, example applications um, of deeper networks have been around for three decades. I can think of three reasons for that. Um, the universal function approximation theorem that I just described, as it provided a compelling argument that shadow neural networks are fully capable of learning any function. Second is the principle of parsimony, as networks with fewer hidden layers are generally deemed less complex and more understandable. And the third one is the difficulty of training, as networks with more hidden layers are more complex to train. But neural networks nowadays have many hidden layers, sometimes with hundreds of millions of parameters. Even you can now find papers with billions of uh, parameters in a, in a deep neural network. So what, had, what has changed to make this push for deep neural networks? I think it is all about the difficulty of training. Difficulty of deep learning, uh, deep, uh, deep networks has been actually made much easier in the last 10 years or so. The beginning of this change is commonly attributed to the work of Hinton and his colleagues in back in 2006, where unsupervised learning was used to pre-train deep neural networks. They show unsupervised learning could effectively initiate, uh, in, initialize the network's parameters such that the subsequent training efforts through backpropagation would become more successful. I will not explain here what unsupervised learning means in this context, and uh, I will only say that it is some heuristic way of layer by layer pre-training. So that pre-training pre pre approach has now actually been uh, abandoned. Instead, the boom in computational power has actually made the old backpropagation algorithms capable of training deep neural networks, even with millions of parameters. A game changer was the introduction of GPUs or graphics processing units to the neural network community um, as a powerful tool to massively parallelize and thus expedite the training algorithm. And that, that happened in late 2000 and early 2010s. And also the investment by mega companies such as, such as Google in this field, as well as emerging new and very successful applications on neural networks in the era of 
smartphones might might also partially explain this revival, resulting in huge success in image processing, speech recognition, gaming, and uh, so on. Now, back to the title of this talk. How does deep learning models, which are essentially neural networks, compared with process-based models? I think this question should be important, particularly to our students who are starting their work and possibly their research careers. If they do a quick review of the literature, they would find, find out that machine learning and in particular deep learning has been extensively used to model systems for which process-based models are also available. And actually, a fairly large part of that literature benchmarks machine learning models against process-based models. And just to be clear, uh, by a process-based model, here I mean any model that is based on mechanics and causal relationships that are known in the knowledge domain, basically evolved uh, based on extensive observations and uh, basically monitoring over the years. To compare, let's look more under the hood of deep learning. Deep learning is rooted in connectionism, hyperflexibility, and vigorous optimization, which are fundamentally different from the guiding principles of classic process-based modeling. These differences uh, are often ignored, but I think they must be considered at the heart of modeling efforts that use deep learning in Earth and environmental sciences. What is connectionism? Connectionism is an approach that stacks many identical or similar algebraic operators, both in parallel and in series, such that they can collectively perform complicated tasks. In this, in this approach, the role and functions of different individual operators in, pro, in uh, producing the model response are not distinguishable. And of course, it is uh, unlike the modular approach, typically adapted in process-based modeling, where each module of a model is designed to represent some process. And the relationship of the modules are clear to the modeler. And ultimately, all these modules work and interact to achieve some goal, like just pushing that bike forward. As a result, considerations of identifiability and equifinality uh, of model structure and parameters uh, become irrelevant in deep learning. What is hyperflexibility? It's a characteristic of a model that can literally fit any data set with any desired level of accuracy owing to its excessive degree of freedom. This can be viewed as the inversion of Occam's razor or law of parsimony, which has always been a guiding principle in scientific discovery and model building. Also, a hyperflexible model like neural networks are controlled by parameters that possess no physical meaning. Unlike process-based models that have relatively fewer degrees of freedom, controlled by parameters that possess some physical meaning. And the last one, vigorous optimization, is the practice of manipulating model parameters at any cost to maximize the goodness of feed to calibration data. In other words, the, the training of neural networks is all about minimizing an error function. Of course, optimization is also often an as essential part uh, in process-based modeling to calibrate model parameters. However, in process-based modeling, minimizing the error is not the goal, but a means to improve the realism of the model, at least in, a, in an ideal world. So back to this slide and how we can compare the two. Overall, these characteristics make deep learning uniquely suitable to handle possible correlations of any form embedded in any data set of variables of any nature. To build complex mappings in high dimensional spaces. As such, 
deep learning can relatively easily scale to any data type and size in terms of both the number of variables involved and samples available. On the other hand, process-based modeling is generally based on causations, presumptive or real, derived from the existing knowledge and experience. Also, the modular, the modular nature of process-based modeling allows for system identification and hypothesis development and testing about different processes involved in a system. But this ability can sometimes render difficult the scalability of process-based models to different data sets, which in cases require altering the model structure and parameterization. The deep learning models are inherently black boxes, and this is a major disadvantage, particularly when compared with process-based modeling. Of course, a deep learning model, a deep learning expert can see and synthesize the model parameters and internal signals and characterize their properties, such as distributions and dynamics. Nevertheless, it's non-trivial, if at all possible, to make sense of why a deep learning model behaves the way it does and uh, how it may respond differently to different perturbations and more importantly to explain those to stakeholder who is not a deep learning expert. Conversely, the behavior of process-based models even under unseen circumstances tend to be more explainable and intuitive supported by the knowledge base available. So, are they truly comparable deep learning versus process-based modeling or they are apples and oranges? The thing is they have extensively been compared in the literature mostly in terms of fitting data and mostly in a care fitting exercise I would say and reportedly deep learning does a superior job in fitting data even in out of sample prediction. To elaborate on some of the points discussed, I'm now going to walk you through a fairly simple and typical modeling experiment that runs and compares both types of models for the same problem. This, ex uh, this experiment models the hydrologic system of the Old Man River watershed in Alberta, Canada, with an area of almost 1,500 square kilometers. On average, this watershed receives about 600 millimeters of precipitation, rainfall plus snowfall annually. It has a long-term average temperature of 2.2 degrees Celsius and generates about 12 square cubic meters per second of river flow. Here we use 30 years of data. The first 22 years were used for model calibration that is seen data in model development and the last eight years for model validation, that is the unseen data in model development. The first three months of the calibration period were used for model spin up as well. And in the case of deep learning, the calibration period was further broken into training 17 years and testing five years, uh, the latter for early stopping of the training process to avoid overfitting. And I should note that the naming convention in the DL context for validation and testing period is often the other way around. Let me just close my window. Okay, to, to model this system, Standard LSTM neural network was chosen here as a state-of-the-art deep learning model that accounts for time dependency and memory. And the LSTM configuration used has 166 uh, calibration parameters. For benchmarking purposes, the HBV model, which is a classic and well-established hydrologic model with only 12 parameters was used. Each of these parameters has uh, has a physical interpretation and a physically justified uh, feasible range. And the inputs to the models are daily precipitation, 
and temperature, and the output is the concurrent flow that I'm showing on the screen. So the calibration of the two models were done by, by uh, maximizing the goodness of feed to data with the Sutcliffe efficiency, or NSE, as the objective function. And as you know, NSE is essentially a normalized version of mean squared errors with a value of one indicating a perfect feed. And as a rule of thumb, hydrologists often call an NSE of 0.7 or so, or higher, an acceptable feed. The LSTM model was calibrated using back propagation with an early stopping strategy to avoid overfitting, and the HPV model was calibrated by a multi-star Newton type optimization algorithm. Five independent replicates of calibration experiments with different initial seeds were conducted to account for possible variability of model performance, and here is the result. The plot to the right compares the performance of HPV and that of LSTM in calibration. The figure shows all five replicates of LSTM outperform those of HPV, which is great. And based on these results, and as ex ex expected, the superiority of LSTM over HPV in calibration is quite significant in terms of the goodness of feed to stream flow. But before checking the model uh, performance in validation, let us, let us step back and investigate what we have achieved in terms of learning from data. The development of LSTM model was not based on any a priori knowledge of how a watershed system works and the governing physical principles. As such, the model learned everything from scratch, merely using examples from data. Basically, the model started with a fully randomized internal configuration controlled by a large number of parameters, and here that was 186, and then tuned those parameters to adapt to the internal functioning of LSTM, to the underlying real-world system represented in the data. So to better see that, let's look at this plot, which shows the LSTM performance of two arbitrarily, cho arbitrarily chosen replicates. Before, before calibration and after calibration, the blue one, for a two-year sub-period of the calibration period. The model response to input before calibration seems to be completely random, but after calibration, the model response has learned to closely follow the underlying system response. Unlike LSTM, HPV encodes the expert knowledge available in the field of hydrology. The model is a collection of conservation of mass equations and process parameterizations that represent how hydrologists conceptualize the way a watershed works. The physically, this physically informed modeling structure is presumably able to emulate the behavior of any watershed by using only 12 parameters. This other plot to the right shows how the model performs, the, the HPV model performed before calibration with parameter values chosen to be at the midpoint of their ranges. The figure shows that the uncalibrated model responds reasonably, uh, reasonably to the inputs. It generally captures the timing of flows and emulates the low flow segments well but is overly responsive to some large precipitation events, generating spurious spikes in flows. But then calibration, the blue curve here, either manual or by, uh, manual by expert knowledge or aut automatic as done here uh, by optimization can fix that discrepancy and fit the model output to observations. So then a fundamental difference between the two models uh, become more clear. Using a process-based model is about directly using a wealth of expert knowledge available in a scientific field, while using neural networks is about learning everything from scratch, directly from data. And uh, this difference is manifest in the number of parameters that need to be tuned to achieve a reason reasonable performance in each model. So as we saw in the previous slide, the LSTM model achieved a better performance in fitting calibration data. However, in any modeling exercise, 
one needs to ensure the model gives the right answer for the right reasons. That is why proper model evaluation in out of sample prediction is critically important as I will discuss next. So the standard practice for validation of a model is to test its performance in terms of reproducing some historical record not seen during model calibration, right? A process typically called out of sample prediction. This plot shows the result of such practice in the validation period for both the LSTM and HBV models. In this case, both models do reason reasonably well according to NSE, but LSTM here uh, outperforms HBV across all five replicates. So HBV is here and LSTM are all of them are ahead of HBV in terms of goodness of fit or a nice slot clip. Consistent with what we just saw, the hydrologist literature is full of such conclusions that ANNs are superior to process-based models in both calibration and validation. So is this the end of story? Perhaps not. The thing is, uh, as Oreskes nicely articulated many years ago, the above so-called model validation is inherently partial. While the performance of LSTM appears to be better than that of HBV, in a relative sense, one needs to take extra care before making such a conclusion. As, uh, as argued but by Vid Klimesh, more than three decades ago, a strong assumption in this type of validation is that the conditions under which the model will be used will be similar to the conditions under which the model has been developed and calibrated. It is now well recognized that such an assumption may not, may not hold, as many national systems are essentially non-stationary. Despite such recognition, this standard model validation uh, practice has arguably, arguably remained unchained, uh, unchanged. So to further elaborate on this point, uh, I took a stress test approach via a what if scenario question to test and compare the performance of both models in true out of sample prediction, basically under conditions that have not fully uh, been seen in the process of model development and calibration. The question is how the system would behave if the average temperature warmed by two degrees Celsius while everything else remained the same. And sorry guys, uh, of course I understand that you are the Fahrenheit people. So to assess this scenario, both calibrated models were fed a new temperature time series obtained by adding two degrees Celsius to all daily temperature value. So these new synthetic inputs roughly provide a picture of what might happen in the watershed under global warming. The modeling results under such scenarios, as you know, are typically used to inform policy making for climate change adaptation. Now let us evaluate the possible changes in the watershed behavior in response to a two degrees warming before, sorry, based on the two modeling approaches. Here, instead of looking at individual simulated time series, like I showed before, the possible change in the average seasonality of flows is of interest. So first look at this plot to check the consistency of simulated flows for the historical period. The red envelope shows the response of LSTM across the five replicates, while the blue envelope shows the performance of HBV across the five replicates. Both models generally follow the observed seasonality more or less, but the range provided by the LSTM model is generally narrower and better encapsulates observation in both low and high flows. And now let's look at the condition uh, under the new hypothetical scenario. Again, the red envelope is LSTM and the blue envelope is HBV. Apparently, under the new condition, the two models show two distinct behaviors. 
According to LSTM, peak summer flows would decline by about 25% on average, and the time of peak would shift backward by about a week, from the beginning of June to a time in the fourth week of May. According to HVV, however, the changes would be more pronounced. The peak flow would decline uh, by about 35%, and the flow might show two modes, the larger at the beginning of May and the other at the beginning of June at about the same time as the peak uh, in the historical observations. So uh, are such differences not sufficiently large to make the user skeptical about the modeling process? I was uh, struck uh, by, by this, these differences myself. Now the question is, what model should we trust? Deep learning or process-based models? In other words, which one produced the most credible picture of possible watershed behavior under the new conditions not seen in the pre-def records? In practice, of course, this question is very difficult to answer if possible whatsoever. Previous research on the Canadian Rocky Mountains has indicated that warming alone will result in a considerable reduction in flows and earlier peaks in watersheds, similar to the Old Man watershed. And such possible shifts are now major concerns for local water authorities and agricultural sector in the region that I live. And any credible estimate of that would be very helpful. A synthesis, a synthesis of research efforts under the change, Changing Cold Region Network and the cold interior of Western Canada that I was a part of indicates a shift in timing of the spring hydrograph rise and peak flows of nearly two weeks earlier by mid 21th century and as much as one month by the end of 21st century. Beyond this question, what is worrisome at a fundamental level is the large divergence in the, explore, uh, in the extrapolative behavior between models that produce comparable results in standard out-of-sample prediction. Also, the follow-up question is then, when and why should we care the most about true out-of-sample prediction, which is nothing uh, but using models in extrapolation beyond the, the observed data and behaviors used in the model development and calibration? I think a key to addressing this question is to set the modeling purpose up front. So let's visit the overarching purposes of modeling in earth and environmental sciences. The modeling purposes that I could think of may be viewed under three general categories, namely now casting and forecasting, scenario analysis, and diagnostic learning. The first aims to look into now or foreseeable future and predict what will happen, for example, in local or regional weather system. This directly supports real-time operations and management at different levels from individual citizens to local, regional, or global skills. The second is different, of course. It takes a what-if view of the future and aims to answer how the system might respond under new or altered conditions such as climate or land use change. And it supports long-term decisions pertaining to adaptation to change and building resilience in human controlled systems. Conversely, the third one, diagnostic learning, is about looking backward by using models to simulate the past and present behavior of a system to answer why that system behaves as it does. This supports developing and testing new theories and hypotheses, extending uh, our process understanding and knowledge base. In other words, diagnostic learning is about exploring causations and attribution of observed vari variability to controlling factors. For example, to explain the observed sea level rise in the past decades. So how would deep learning or machine learning in general do with respect to each of these modeling purposes? I would, I would think machine learning is or is expected to perform well in now casting and forecasting, particular, particularly when the underlying real world system remains structurally unchanged in the forecasting horizon of interest. 
However, it can become handicapped or unreliable in scenario analysis if a scenario extrapolates well beyond data used to constrain the model or is about a structural change in the underlying system, for example, through human interventions. In such cases, the correlational structure of a variables empirically identified by machine learning may not hold under new conditions. And lastly, machine learning, particularly deep learning, because of its connectionist nature, may arguably be of limited help for diagnostic learning because they are not essentially built for system identification. In other words, it's typically non-trivial to compartmentalize a deep learning model and attribute it its part to the component of the system being modeled. So what I'm trying to get at is, and this is my last slide, there might be hidden issues with any of the shelf application of deep learning techniques that have been largely developed by mathematicians and computer scientists to, problem, to problems in a new domain with no or limited considerations of the available domains, um, domains knowledge base. I think we certainly deal with a different set of issues that computer scientists do, for example, in image recognition. Big extrapolation is our reality uh, in Earth and environmental sciences that many pred predictive models nowadays must face because of non-stationarity in climate and the environment. However, in image, image recognition, for example, a cat will always look like a cat and a dog will always look like a dog. So the classification problem of cats and dogs, and that's a classic problem in computer science when we apply deep learning, for example. So this classification problem is a stationary problem, at least in the time scale of a human life. And when it comes to extrapolation in a non-stationary environment, any purely regression type model, including those arising from learning, would be disadvantaged. As by definition, extrapo uh, extrapolation would require working in parts of the model uh, of the problem space for which they have not received any information. Conversely, process-based models may be salvaged in extrapolation by the domain expert knowledge encoded within them. More recently, research efforts to incorporate the knowledge base into deep learning is proving very useful. This is a new trend. The knowledge base offers a set of principles modulated via conservation laws, monotonicity and rates, and feedback mechanisms. The limits of validity of such principles are typically known and therefore they provide a basis for credibility when it comes to extrapolation. And of course, no machine learning model can automatically account for them. And if you don't, there could be issues. For example, if a modeler, if a model is not informed about conservation of mass or water balance, then the model can falsely introduce or lose water in the course of simulation, as it happens always. Or if the model is not informed about uh, the heat snow melt monotonic relationship, it might, might spuriously feed noise in data that suggests otherwise, that for example, that relationship has modes or non-monotonic parts. Lastly, it is, it is certainly an exciting time for earth and environmental sciences to benefit from deep learning tools. Research on fusing the knowledge base with deep learning is still limited though and embryonic, but growing even in our field and has great potential for developing a generation of models that rightfully leverage big data and computational power. And that is about where I'm going to end this talk. Just want to add that for more information on fusing deep learning and knowledge base and uh, a hydrologic modeling example on how this can happen and some good references in our field and also beyond in computer science. You may refer, refer to this paper that I introduced at the beginning and I think the final uh, version of this paper will be accepted for publication hopefully in a couple of weeks and a follow-up piece will come out soon of course. Thank you all very much for your time and the invite and everything. Very exciting. And uh, yeah, just 
a science tip here that I hope you don't miss out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saman. What a wonderful and informative talk. Um, just to understand the basics here and its applications to hydrology. So we're going to open. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. If you need to take a breath, uh, we'd like it to open to questions. I'm going to first check in the chat and see if any questions are coming in. Okay. All right. So I'm going to back up here. I'm finally in the chat. Um, OK, I have a long question from uh, Jin Wong Yu. I hope this is the first question here. I think it is. I don't know if you can read that, Saman, but if not, I'm going to read it for you and everyone. Thank you for your informative presentation. It seems reasonable that the LSTM model performs better than a physics-based model during the historical period over which the LSTM has been trained. For a future scenario of the Earth climate, how did you apply the LSTM for the non-stationary state of the ex climate uh, in your example? Did you employ a method to keep the LSTM model trained over the shifting climate period as well? Thank you. So uh, I use the standard uh, training procedure it's very similar to what others, including in our field, do when they train LSTM. Yes, it was trained on the historical record, uh, on some period called calibration period, and then it was tested on validation period, which was, again, part of the historical record, of course, and it showed superior performance. But in scenario uh, analysis part, there was no observed stream flow, of course, because that is a hypothetical scenario when you do scenario analysis to inform uh, decision makers. So I just used the model calibrated based on historical record to estimate what might happen in the future under the altered condition. And of course, the point was uh, perhaps it's not easy to say if LSTM was right or wrong, but the point I tried to highlight was that it, the response was way different from a more physically based models. Uh, that that, that I think it would be alarming to a large extent to people who just use these techniques to and apply them in some unseen condition, in extrapolation basically. And uh, I'm not here really to say LSTM is good or bad. I, I'm, I'm just trying to some extent uh, basically educate about the pros and cons of the different approaches. Okay, thank you very much. And Jin Wong, thanks you as well. I don't see any other questions. Are there any other questions? Uh, I don't see any hands raised or M anything in the chat. Mike, I, I, I see a question perhaps directly sent to me. Uh, not sure what is actually learned still with the machine learning. That is the question. Yes, I saw that from, uh, but go ahead, take okay. it. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if that was a statement or a question. Yeah, so, uh, so I would say LSTM learned to map inputs to outputs. That was it learned, and that could be useful in now casting and forecasting when you want to quickly predict something based on some sort of mapping in a high dimensional space. But beyond that, it didn't tell me much, if any, for example, about changes in the processes. So it's more a black box that could do a good and strong mapping but beyond that, you have to be careful or you have to introduce some physics, I would say, into the machine learning model to be able to really learn uh, beyond what I just said. Okay, thank you. 
Another question from Elijah Orland. Thank you for this talk. I saw a recent deep learning example that tried to impose some physical constraints through modifying a loss function to penalize physically inconsistent results. As this is a very recent example, have you seen this sort of technique gain any traction among others? Yes, sure. Uh, yeah, so in the, so let me tell you this, the notion of hy hybrid modeling or hybridization of process-based models and uh, machine learning has been around at least for 20 years and you could find papers uh, really uh, digging uh, deeper uh, deep into those things but those papers typically didn't gain much traction 10 15 20 years ago but you could find some references in the paper that i showed more recently, I would say in the last three to five years, yes, uh, you see some good papers that are receiving a lot of traction and uh, there have been uh, there have been methods uh, named physics informed neural networks, uh, physics uh, informed machine learning and basically different people come up with different ideas to inject some physics into machine learning and they name them differently based on some different principles. Uh, yes, there has been some traction uh, and I have used them. I, I'm trying to contribute to, to that, uh, that, that area as well. Uh, I would say it's, it's not easy or straightforward in general. So the, the, the kind of approach that you ask about is about penalizing the neural network if it violates, for example, the physical laws that you are aware of. Of course, that's good if you know something is true, if you're aware of some physical process you could somehow force your network to respect that kind of behavior. Again, that might not be that helpful in diagnostic learning, for example. Again, it, it, it comes up to the modeling purpose uh, and it cannot help you to, uh, to, um, to discover or to, to advance science, to discover, uh, discover new processes or new functions of how the system works or for systems identification. I would say there are better approaches already out there for um, to, to, to apply machine learning techniques to really uh, for real scientific discovery, but that area is still very emb embryonic. Some very good papers, I think in the years to come, we are gonna see those methods applied in earth and environmental sciences as well. And I, I, think, I, I think the point is in particular at this point that there is a lot of excitement and shift in funding and a lot of new students are just using these techniques. Uh, we just need to be mindful to keep balance uh, between the two paradigms and try to reconcile them, to try to co-evolve them rather than let them, them evolve in isolation. Okay, thank you, Saman. Uh, we have three more questions here and we have two minutes, so we'll just take them quickly. Um, from uh, Sharia, Ahmad, where do you think the synergy between DL and process-based modeling going on from here in the coming decade? Is DL going to take over hydrological modeling? Uh, it's a little loaded question here, but what do you think? I definitely don't think so. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I think, I mean, I'm skeptical really. Because as I showed about uh, the AI winters, uh, my, my fear is that that kind of winters may come to our field at some point after a lot of excitement for the next, let's say, five years, we might see a huge decline in funding, for example, available for this kind of research, unless, unless we really think deeper about these things, about these two methods and try to bring them together. Otherwise, I think process understanding is core to scientific discovery and uh, yeah, so um, I'm a, yeah, I used to be a machine learning core machine learning person. I'm not anymore. But yeah, I'm uh, most of my work currently is on process based modeling, but a lot of it I think depends on how we educate or train the next generation of scientists for the years to come. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a request to please share the link for the study with the group. And then there's a follow up that says there's a link on the APS journal uh, regarding uh, maybe maybe the answer to that question. Uh, a quick question here. Uh, can one extract valid mechanistic information by iteratively applying a constant deep learning method with differing input 
slash predictors. Yeah, th th that is something uh, uh, that has been done extensively, I would say, in hydrology, for example, in, in the last 20 years. And uh, I remember reading a commentary paper and they named it interest. Uh, they, they gave it very interesting term, this kind of practice. Uh, they named it um, neural network interrogation. Basically, you, you do different inputs and outputs and you try to interrogate the model to find some correlational relationships that might describe what you're looking for between the wide range of possible inputs and whatever outputs you have. Uh, yes, definitely that, that uh, has helped us significantly over the past at least 20 years. And I think I have seen a good number of papers really trying to, to do those things. Uh, and just so uh, more, more data mining approach to, to try to, to extract some correlational relationships, or at least to, to say what is controlling what. And then as, as a prerequisite for hypothesis development about causal relationships. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one quick final question from uh, Bailing Lee. What software, software did you use to build the deep learning program? Yeah, so I used to be a MATLAB person, but now, of course, Python, um, TensorFlow, Keras. You these are, are on mute now. We cannot hear you. So uh, I see. am on mute. No, there you go. We're good now. Oh, I don't know what happened. Yeah, so uh, I used to be a MATLAB person. So in my earlier career, when I was doing neural network, I was using MATLAB basically. But now uh, Python, TensorFlow, Keras, uh, all built in Python are quite strong. And uh, what the result of what I just showed were, were based on TensorFlow and Keras in Python. OK. All right, thank you, Saman. And our last comment is something we all share. is a big thank you for, uh, for your presentation today. This is really outstanding. We learned a lot. I mean, you outlined the fundamentals. This is a good place to start. The future is, you know, wide open for us and working out many of the, the details. And uh, and this is really our first talk on uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence. So we, we've learned a lot. We greatly appreciate you uh, taking your time to put together the presentation. Uh, we also thank uh, Mean uh, for suggesting you as our guest speaker. It's really been a win-win for us, I, I hope it's a win for you too, and enhancing your exposure and perhaps inter providing more opportunities for collaboration. So I'm going to ask uh, everyone to go off mood, mute and uh, give you a big hand, uh, applause. If, see if, uh, <laughs> Yeah, this was really wonderful. Yeah, we, we thank you very much. It has been a, a very exciting to give this talk to your high profile group, and I'm really hoping one day I can interact with you face in face in person, uh, hopefully soon. I'm sure. I'm sure this will, will happen. God willing. OK, so I'm officially going to close the meeting, uh, the seminar, uh, and I think we should perhaps let Saman go and open his window back up and get some uh, cooler air in the in the house. I understand it's very hot out in yeah. the house today. <laughs> so uh, pretty hot on the East Coast too. Yeah. So thank, thank you very much. Um, and thank all the attendees for, you know, for your presence here today, your interest. And if you have any suggestions for future meetings, please, please uh, email me and, and we can get them on the agenda. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.